Hi everyone, welcome to my talk, The Art of Deleting. My name is Alvaro Seysa and I'm a writer and researcher. These are difficult times we are all living through, so I appreciate the fact that you've taken some time aside to watch the talk. So please, sit back, tighten your seat belts, and enjoy the ride! Today I am presenting my current research on the art of deleting, which focuses on the relation between poetry and material erasure. This research and book project are funded by the European Commission and the Norwegian Research Council. In the first part of my talk, I will discuss erasure poetics. I am presenting some examples of literary and visual works that show erasure marks. Not all poets writers and visual artists are using erasing techniques in the same manner, and they are not adopting erasure poetics to address the same themes. In the second part, I will address archival work on erasure and censorship practices during the dictatorial new state regime in Portugal that is between 1933 and 74. Finally, I will discuss how erasure poetics and documents can further our understanding of deletion markers with aesthetic, social and political motivations. The art of deleting is also the art of underlining, because ultimately erasure is about what is made visible and what is made invisible. It is about negative and positive space. Part 1. On Erasure Poetics my argument is that erasure cannot be thought of independently of its socio-political dimensions, even though it can aesthetically serve a creative work independently of its socio-political dimensions. I am not alone, though, in partaking of this critical perspective. Hannah Henderson's Being in a State of Erasure explores the very notion that erasure is, first and foremost, what the body feels and what it is subjected to. Quote, let us not begin in the archive. Let us instead begin in my bedroom, instigates the author. As Anderson moves on to show our Jamaican family in blackness are rendered invisible because too visible in the context of 1970s and today's UK society, the book blends the deeply personal and the rescued archival material. In addressing Franz Fanon's work on racism and colonialism and Edouard Glissant's Poetics of Relation, Henderson reinforces how racial prejudice erases the body as a site of violence. The topic of erasure as violence is already contained in a previous work from She with a Water Cradled, a blackout intervention on Virginia Woolf's work that is, and I quote, contemplating the violence entailed in reducing an individual anonymous by means of obliterating their voice." End of quote. Race and erasure have been debated most notably by Robin Cost Lewis and, before, by Nervo C. Philip. Philip's book Zong is exemplary in this respect because the material marks left by the erasure of text act in tandem with the obliterated human lives and their stories, which the author uncovers by deleting and isolating the legal text of the court record Gregory v. Gilbert, the only account left from a brutal act of murder committed in 1781 by the ship captain of the slave boat Zong, who, quote, ordered that some 150 Africans be murdered by drowning so that the ship's owners could collect insurance monies." End of quote. Erasure can mean stressing silences, acts of removal, obliteration and deletion. It can mean thinking how slavery and racial profiling occurs, how minorities are silenced, how population, journalists, authors or protesters are suppressed, how thinking and discourse is controlled, surveilled and removed, by a number of entangled physical and digital systems, but is also about privacy and the right to be forgotten. On a compositional and formal level, 
erasure often means appropriating and modifying found material in order to partially covering its content while uncovering a new reading and meaning. A literary erasure is a textual, artistic and aesthetic strategy that is constrained and uses controlled control vocabulary. But if for some the spheres of the poetic, the aesthetic and the political seem naturally connected, for others they do not correlate. Consider formalist or neoconceptual writing devoid of intentional political perspective, even if we might hear about the politics of language or the politics of the poem. Today, we will see some of these works, which are more concerned with form and poetics, but we will also see works that highlight themes and practices of resistance and activism, for instance, by connecting erasure with a critique of censorship and surveillance, that is, that think about erasure as a political act. And when I mean political, I mean political poetry, not the politics of poetry. Political poetry focuses on political issues and the affairs of the polis, or as Joaquim Sartorius asserted, quote, a poem is political when it has a political theme, therefore, when the starting point to write a poem has a political nature, or when the author intends, through the poem, to follow a political objective and situate it in a political context." End of quote. So Mas Sharif has precisely reflected on how erasure needs to be thought of politically. Quote, the first time I confronted erasure as an aesthetic tactic, I was horrified. I know it was an erasure undertaken by a poet of the United States. I know it was after the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan after extraordinary rendition and disappeared men flown to secret sites in Somalia, certainly after attempted annihilation of indigenous languages and peoples, after the enforced illiteracy of black slaves. I know I thought of erasure as what a state does. The proliferation of erasure as a poetic tactic in the United States is happening alongside a proliferation of our awareness of it as a state tactic. And it seems many erasure projects today hold these things as unrelated. Poetic erasure means the striking out of text. Poetic erasure has yet to advance historically. Historically, the striking out of text is the root of obliterating peoples. End of quote. Moving from prose to poetry, Sharif skillfully enacts her understanding of erasure as an aesthetic, poetic, and political signifier. In Look, besides resituating violence via the military dictionary, the poet exposes yet another type of brutality when she fictionally stages the deletions made to the letters received by Salim, a Guantanamo prisoner. Instead of working with found material, Sharif reimagines state erasure as voids in the poem's lines. Visual marks of erasure in literary works can be traced back at least to Lawrence Stern's Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy, Gentleman, from 1759 to 67, or Heinrich Heine's poetical narrative Reise Bilder, from 1827, in which the author denounces state censorship by satirically mimicking the censor's cuts. As you see here, Heinz parody erases all words except for the German censors idiots. In the early 21st century, there has been an increase of literary and artistic works that use erasure as a form of composition that range from print to the computational. Across media and fields, erasure makes its way through the graphic taste of an epoch as a trend. In literature, following Brian McHale and Tra Travis McDonald's essays, Andrew Epstein speaks of a, quote, mini trend in erasure poetics, end of quote. Mini or maxi, peripheral or mainstream, we can certainly speak of an impulse to erase. Eraser is staged in advertisement, like here in Bergen, in a front shop window, 
or in newspaper front covers, like what happened with Australia's Right to Know coalition in 2019, when the media protested for freedom of expression and transparency. Erasure is also staged in generalist book covers and art catalogs that do not seem to speak about erasure. It inspires typefaces, such as Emil Cozola's Project Scene, which live generates three forms of deletion based on the NSA's monitoring keyword list, and according to the author, is, quote, an experiment of evasive and reflexive reflexive techniques around the topic of online privacy, end of quote. Or Titus Capar and Reginald Betts' redaction, a font that defaces its content in progressive stages, as part of a project that, quote, seeks to highlight the abuses in the criminal justice system, in particular the way poor and marginalized people are imprisoned for failure to pay court fines and fees." End of quote. Erasure is explored in visual arts, such as in Adrian Piper's Everything, a series of photocopied photographs that prevent any possibility of facial recognition by way of sending the images and overprinting them with the sentence, everything will be taken away. The practice of erasing in order to create new poems is not a Western phenomenon, as we see by the Taiwanese Shanzai Shi magazine and author collective. It has given rise to poetry generators, do-it-yourself newspaper blackout books, self-help therapeutic blackout poetry, and according to John Carroll, communities of hope in Instagram. And even a New York Times blackout poetry contest directed at teenagers. Among others, these publications and events have popularized the labels Erasure Poetry and Blackout Poetry. As of November 1920, searching for the tags Erasure Poetry, and Blackout Poetry, show some overlapping of techniques in both tags, but also that while Erasure Poetry has 27,000 posts, Blackout Poetry has 170,000. A numbing effect of hit results is also easy to reach by using a search engine site and typing Erasure Poem. This is evidence enough that the techniques of erasing found material have become popular. Now, I want to suggest that the relation between art, literature, poetry, and erasure can be approached in a broader way. How shall we consider a piece as Gerard Rum's 1969 sound poem on censored speech?
broader look at the intersection of erasure and the arts, at least since the 1960s experimental arts, has already galvanized revisions in thematic issues of journals or exhibitions, such as the Reach Gathering in Under Erasure in New York. Curators Heather and Raphael Rubinstein write that, quote, for Derrida, as for Heidegger before him, to put a word under erasure, sur ratur, is to signal the inadequacy of inherited language while also recognizing its inevitability. Since Derrida introduced the concept, this emphatically visual act of intervention has become an indispensable technique in diverse disciplines. End of quote. So we are drawn to infer that from the late 60s onwards, influenced by Derrida, even though De la Grammatologie only came out in English translation in 1976, artists have steadily and increasingly pursued erasing techniques as compositional procedures in their artistic practice. That is very much the case with, for instance, the book Being by Henderson that I just shown earlier. But is it really so? Looking at the antecedents may reveal a more complex picture. Even though there have been attempts at differentiating the two bigger labels of erasure poetry and blackout poetry, the truth is that they both hide and reveal and they both delete and underline. Constellations or family resemblances start emerging once common features or patterns become more evident. This is only possible by trying to document as many creative works as possible that deal with material erasure. In this slide, you can see an extract of my ongoing spreadsheet that documents such creative works. I have now documented more than 400 works of erasure worldwide. In order to describe them, I document different fields such as author, title, country, year, language, publication type, source material and type, erasure type, software, URL, and so on. Once this data is assembled, it is of course possible to filter its content in different ways. For example, we can look at the temporal progression of publication dates. So I started looking at the distribution per decade whenever I would finish documenting one sample of 100 works. It is curious to notice that jumping from a sample of 100 to 200 to 300 to then 400 creative works, we see a slight increase during the 1960s to 90s. But it is, it is really in the 2000s and 2010s that there is an explosion ending with more than the double of works in the 2010s in relation to the preceding, preceding decade. A number of reasons for this fact might have to do with the curation of my data and its documentation process, as bias is built into the way in which I search and find words. But from this sample, it is still possible to extrapolate. The reasons for the erasing impulse after the turn of the millennium may well have to do with the growing access to the internet in industrialized countries, how easily data can be reproduced and modified in digital media, the proliferation of databases and the concentration of social networks, the popularization of the form by a number of influential authors, publications and events, and what we could call, following Florian Kramer, post-digital practices. There is also a convergence of historical revisions with resistance and justice. Isabel O'Hara, who has been erasing public apologies of sexual assaulters, argues that, quote, we are living in a time when artists and writers are openly fighting with history and revealing its prejudices. So many people have been erased in the telling of history, so it makes sense to turn the tables and do some erasing right back." End of quote. Spending time documenting so many works, but also trying to classify their origin, materiality, content and techniques, forced me to think and debate erasure in a granular way. Categorizing these items into a typology is a rather complex and difficult task, 
because we are dealing with cultural artifacts in several artistic areas that are analog and digital. In any case, I tried to blend different traditions that emerge from the way in which authors were naming their strategies and techniques, and as such, the erasure typology is a bottom-up model in which I progressively add other types as I document and think through more works of erasure. The typology is made of six layers, the types of documents used as sources, the type of erasure, media, technique, and the reading effect. I created definitions for this taxonomy, but I do not have time to present them in detail here. Visualizing these typology in trees, in cluster or circular dendrograms, can help us thinking about the features of each work the idea is that any work can illuminate one or multiple lines in the diagram. This cluster is only made out of three layers of the typology, source, media, and technique. Here you see a detail of that same classification for when creative works use literary artistic documents or news documents as sources, as well as the type of media and techniques. Here you see the same data, but, but in a circular dendrogram. My purpose is that uh, visualizing the typology in this mode can help us to situate the compositional techniques employed by writers and artists, but also the aesthetic and political affiliations of their works based, for instance, on the type of technique or the legal or political nature of the appropriated documents. This visualization type constitutes a kind of ecosystem of erasure. But when I display the full typology, I obtain a rather different picture. So now we have the six layers. We have source, erasure, media, technique, and effect. I actually like this uh, visualization because in fact it erases the erasure typology. Perhaps this means that my typology is too complex or that it is in fact impossible or even irrelevant to classify and categorize cultural artifacts in this manner. This is, of course, a question of scale and representation. Overall, what the documentation and classification actually makes clear is that erasure is not an homogeneous but rather a heterogeneous field of practices. This has to do with the themes staged in each work, but also the sources that authors use to erase, the ways they erase things, and what media and techniques they use. There is therefore a striking variety. But another way of filtering can happen via the aggregation of works into constellations. The fact is that after a while we start finding common processes techniques or thematic affiliations. Better or worse, some works share resemblances or even direct influence. It is revealing to just oppose some of these works in dialogue and to follow different constellations of these practices, even, th even though the way each work can be filtered or associated with is at times multiple. I cannot show them all here, but um, this is what the constellation of works with blackout as a common denominator looks like. So we have works by Man Ray in the 1920s, Bob Brown in the 1930s, Emile Louis Gros in the 60s, who is still actually active and prolific, Ronald Johnson in the 70s, and more recently, Daniel C. Howe and Catherine Pasig with scripts and computational media. Next, we have a constellation with different types of source material in which the surface is covered with the techniques of overpainting, overwriting, sewing, or collage. This constellation gathers works from the 60s by Gerhard Rum, Doris Cross, Tom Phillips, and Madeline Jeans, and more recently, Jen Bervin and Mary Ruffle.
Part 2. Erasure and Censorship under the Portuguese New State. Since I wanted to understand how erasure was connected to censoring practices, I started researching archival material for, from the Censorship Commission and the Secret and Political Police, PID, or DGS. During the New State, the Portuguese corporatist and fascist regime that ruled the country from 1933 to 1974. After 48 years of various dictatorships and repression, on the 25th of April 1974, a military coup opened the path to freedom and democracy that became known as the Carnation Revolution. The photo by Mario Varela Gomes, that you see here, shows the people and military personnel on top of each other, even climbing the trees, during the siege of the headquarters of the National Republican Guard in Lisbon, where the dictator Marcelo Caetano was hiding. Naturally, people were in ecstasy and the country was boiling. Next day, on the 26th, you see people down in the street witness, witnessing something. But what? Some people took over the last censorship commission's office in the center of Lisbon. From the windows of the censorship office on the second floor, people were throwing down newspaper proofs, correspondence, uh, books, objects, you name it. So goodbye, archive. Now you have to understand that people had been under severe censorship surveillance of known agencies and unknown informers, and propaganda. There was a curtailment of all types of freedom, imprisonment, torture, state assassinations, etc. And this situation just got intensified with the oppressive colonial wars in Africa that started in 1961. Portuguese and African Lusophone culture and media, so the newspapers, radio, TV, the theater, cinema, music, publications were highly censored as well as banned during 48 long years. That is almost half century. Now, despite the recent urban renewal and real estate speculation, the building you see in the photo is still there today. It is almost intact with a saint in the front and another one in the back protecting the building, except that overall it is more derelict. And in the street view, you have a reflection of a mapping car as a bonus. So what happened to the archive? To tell a long story short, I can say that after the extinction of several new state organizations, great part of their archives was luckily and painfully preserved and after many houses and journeys, it ended up in the National Archive of Torre do Tombo in Lisbon. At least since the 1990s, it is possible to do great research on these topics. So that you have an idea of their extension, half portion of the archives of the political police PID has never been consulted. So when it comes to the censorship commission, because the new state institutions were so laborious and organized in keeping records of everything, you can expect to have a good overview of newspaper or periodical proofs and the materiality of the censor's cuts. And as you can see here with the cultural magazine Vertis, in even archiving anonymous denouncements on the right side. Even though there have been thorough studies about the press and preprint censorship of newspapers and periodicals, postprint literary book censorship has hardly been treated in a, in a systematic manner. Among other reasons, this is a consequence of a supposed lost library, the library of censored and forbidden books of the Direção dos Serviços de Censura. But what happened to this library archive? Where are the books? No one seemed to know until last year, at least poets, writers, publishers, booksellers, 
historians and literary scholars that I have interviewed. But there were at least 11,000 censored titles. So it was very strange that all of them had gone missing between one day and the next. They had to be somewhere or spread among many places. Now comes the fascinating story. After several clues, talks and visits to dead and living archives, I had a revealing meeting at the BNP, the National Library of Portugal. There I was being shown a copy of one of those books, which had an extra gift inside, a book report from the censor. This hidden library, which in part the censors kept in archive in their main office, remained in boxes at the National Library from 1974 until 2009. It then started to be progressively catalogued, but with no provenance description, tagging or physical protection. For instance, in a special or reserved collection. The books physically enter the shelves of the library's deposit tower, as you see here, bit by bit, as the newly 2009 legal deposit books would also be catalogued and placed in the shelves. This meant that, except for librarians and some few people who knew it, there was no way any reader could find these books unless they were requested by chance, say, if you wanted an older edition of a particular book. The first proof is that, until today, no mention has been made in scientific literature and all the exhibitions devoted to forbidden books under the new state have never shown this treasure which was actually rescued from the mob attack that you've just seen at the request of the historian and director of the National Library at the time, Oliveira Marques. Today, together with librarians Manuela Rego and Luis Sá, we have been, as we say, fishing for these books among the library's tower book deposit. We are still documenting and preserving the books, but we estimate that around 1,000 books of the Censorship Commission are kept at the National Library. Exhibitions so far, such as the Forbidden Books in the New State from 2004, have shown the editions that were censored, but not the original books that were read or not read, reviewed, censored and marked with cuts. This exhibition's catalog is rich in documentation and interesting as well because you see how erasure and censorship are emphasized in the graphic design of the book's cover as blackouts and inside as strikethroughs. It is a question of visual rhetoric and semiotics. What then are the main consequences of unboxing but in turn hiding this library among the National Library's two million titles. There are great implications at the level of memory, cultural heritage, history of literature, ideas and intellectual life, and the legacy of Antonio Salazar and Marcelo Caetano's dictatorship in today's society at large. Because no one has ever seen the lost library, no one has studied the original books censored by the fascist regime. To reverse this fact, to preserve the materiality of the books and to inform the public about the impact of literary censorship, this unique cultural artifact will be revealed for the first time in 2021, next year, in an exhibition at the National Library that I am co-curating. So my plan now is to create a meta-archive called Censura, which will focus on literary censorship in the Lusophone sphere during the 40 years of activity of the New State book censorship. It will serve as an umbrella between different archives and libraries and represent these books and their related documentation 
in an open access and collaborative database with hyperlinked information. I will show an example of what kind of research can be done with these findings. Virgilio Ferreira's uh, neorealist novel Vagão Jota, from 1946, was forbidden on March 9, 1947, as you can see by the stamp in its cover. Now the book spine has a number 3551 and written on a typical old library label. By tracking down the card index of the Censorship Commission, it is possible to confirm in its data that the book was forbidden on that specific date, as you see on top, prohibit, forbidden. But it is also possible to read that the destination of the book after being reviewed and censored was the censorship's library archive. Then we have three numbers, one down, that is processo numero 81, process number 81, is a process of the book with publisher's correspondence and information about the destruction of all copies of the book as old paper, and another one on the top right corner that indicates the card file number, that is the book number, 3551. Then we have yet another number on the top left corner that indicates the book report number, 2982. Then, by tracking down the book report, it is finally possible to verify all information regarding the network of documents about the censored book via a triangulation of sources. On the, the left top corner, we have the book number. At the top center, we have the number of the report. Here we also have the pros of the censor reviewing the book as focusing on, quote, a family of degenerated people that have sex in front of their kids, end of quote, and that the author touches upon the social issue of class between rich and poor. Therefore, it should be forbidden. And you find many, many other reports with all sorts of information that makes you laugh, it makes you cry, it makes you happy, it makes you sad. The book reports, as well as other documents, have been available for some years now at the National Archives and other private archives such as the Fundação Mário Soares e Maria Barroso and Ephemera. We can read the pseudo-literary reviews, mostly done by military personnel, at least up until the 60s, but also the pages that they indicate as having special problems or following with their own cuts. But we didn't have the books. Now, from reading many reports, it is possible to understand that the two main obsessions from the point of view of the new state order was political subversion or communism and immorality or pornography. But now that we have some of the original books, it is possible to cross-check the book reports, the pages that are annotated, with the artifacts themselves. This is an invaluable resource because now when we open the book we can read the, the passages that were deemed unfit, problematic, to be excised or changed. Here we have <clears throat> page 71 of Virgilio Ferreira's novel that has the expression Corpo Fresco de Virgem body of fresh virgin crossed out by the censor. So back in 1988, British scholar Colin Ignat noticed a lack of bibliographic studies in book censorship in Portugal. Ignat referred with surprise to the dismissal of the card index of the censorship commission. Since then, no study has fully taken into account this information system 
which is the master index of all documents related to how book censorship operated in connection with the secret police, the postal services, the different state institutions headed by Salazar, and later Caetan. So here you see an original card filed under letter D on the book Cuba, Socialism and Development by René Dumont, which was forbidden in 1969. But the letter D file is an exception due to access conditions I have spent two weeks manually digitizing the card index but not the original one rather the photocopies as you see here because there are almost 8,000 cards photocopied in poor conditions. I cannot OCR them. And so, wish me luck, because I'll be spending more five months manually transcribing all their data fields. But why is this so important, you may ask? Well, the good news is that I plan to emulate the information system of the Censorship Commission as a, ca a case of applied information studies in order to automate search processes. So say, whenever we find a tip about a possible book from the original library, we can quickly verify info, but also to structure the digital archive censura. Because as we already found some thousand books at the National Library, judging by the number of book reports, there are still 10,000 books to be recovered. My main goal is to reconstitute and preserve the library of the Censorship Commission in order to study the impact of fascism on book culture and literary history at large and to develop research in forensic and genetic criticism. And from my point of view is also a restitution back to the public. By the way, watching this video is already training your neural network on censored books especially when we see that all the books by or about Simone de Beauvoir were forbidden, and there were many. Now, if we have the original censored book and its subsequent editions, we can do comparative literary studies between pre- and post-revolution editions and try to find out what has changed or not. Here we see that Ferreira's novel got worse in terms of the insults the characters throw at each other. I'm not going to translate. Comparative studies may reveal much more evidence than this, of course. For example, when it comes to Franco's censorship legacy, Spanish researcher Jordi Cornella has just found out that translated authors are still being reprinted today in the Hispanic world with the censored cuts and without the acknowledgement of editors, publishers, readers, cultural institutions, and the general public. This is fascinating. Part 3. Erasure Poetics and the Documentary Form So, by studying the materiality of censoring marks, the legal and political documents from this period, and their legacy, you would perhaps expect that Lusophone writers and artists would be reacting with documentary forms. Before the 1974 revolution, this happened in a small scale. Experimental poets from the 60s, who explored intermedia and the documentary form, seemed more inclined to do this type of work. The Portuguese poet António Aragão created a parody by modifying and erasing parts of a form from the postal services in order to criticize surveillance and the lack of privacy due to, due to the interception of correspondence. But not just the poets. Fiction writers were also doing exciting critiques. Here, in Maria Velho da Costa's novel Desescrita, so de writing, 
the author uses lipograms in order to fictionally mimic what the act of censoring can do to speech and to prose. So there are all these omissions, but they are treated as a flowing text. It is a very strange text in Portuguese. During the 60s, like his friend and novelist Luandin Vieira, Angolan poet Antonio Cardoso, who was a resistant of the popular movement for the liberation of Angola, wrote a series of poems while detained in Luanda's secret police prison, which criticized censorship, political persecution and fascism. And here you have a poem called The Fascist. He has not won. Now, the contemporary landscape is quite different. There are poets today, such as Miguel Manso and Luis Quintais, who have crossed out their book titles or suspended some of their poems, like in Raquel Lima's collection. But in whose work, graphic erasure plays a small role and does not have a political concern, despite, for instance, Lima's political poetry and critique of racism. One of the poets that most often works with erasure is Ricardo Tiago Moura. But for Moura, the crossing out of text appears as a tension between acts of speech, what is said and not said, self-censorship and filtering. The tension between language that describes the real and the real turned into metaphor. Politica, his last poetry collection, advocates for a small politics, which is already present in the previous title, Cruz, and I quote, Pequena política, dizer, não dizer. That would translate freely as small politics, to say, not to say. The type of relation between documents, censorship, creative practice and graphic materiality, as you see in this slide, is to my knowledge almost non-existent in the Portuguese literary sphere. Here you see a comparison between an original poetry book by Bernardo Santareno, censored by the Censorship Commission with cuts, Santareno's plays were heavily censored and forbidden, and similar graphic marks in a document published by Canadian author Aaron Fidever in a thematic issue of the Capilano Review dedicated to the poetics of erasure. Obviously not by influence of Portuguese censorship, but rather by reworking the Canadian. However, in South and North American literary and visual arts, the approach seems to differ. I would like then to come back to another constellation, this time devoted to the redaction of public and secret documents to show how the documentary form is being reused by a number of artists and poets. Here we find works by Jenny Olzer, Cristina Lee Podesva, Carlos Soto Roman, Isabel O'Hara, and Reginald Dwayne Betts. The documentary form has become a site of exposure, of covert state action, gender, class and racial inequality, but also of reinvention of what political art and poetry can be. The use of documents in art, literature and theater has obviously a long tradition, but the use of legal and political documents seems to gain a new impetus especially through the documentary poetry of Philippe Metres or the documentary art of Jenny Holzer. Holzer reuses declassified political documents in the series Redaction Paintings, Archive and Top Secret by investigating a variety of plastic and graphic ways on how to recreate redacted documents through art. The U.S. Freedom of Information Act, but especially after 2006, the fact that U.S. declassified documents that are more than 25 years old are automatically declassified, has perhaps fooled part of this approach. If documents can be used for legal purposes, they can also be modified for creative goals. But as the recent collection writers under surveillance shows, the mechanisms to obtain them are not always made easy, and as such, organizations like Muckrock 
work to help in establishing processes to get this information out. Their work and this book creates evidence for a number of issues, such as Hemingway's intelligence work in Cuba, but especially how major writers and thinkers in the American 20th century have been actively surveilled and repressed. These documents also reveal parallels between countries under the Cold War for controlling, surveilling and censoring individuals and authors. Despite the ideological differences in the US and Portugal from the 50s to the 70s, these documents nonetheless show the identification of common threats to the state apparatus and national security, especially under McCarthyism and the new state, on the grounds of nationalism and patriotism, not patriot enough, political subversion and communism, moral conduct and pornography, and contempt for sexual diversity, class, gender and race equality. Writers and artists have been under surveillance and they still are. They are also many times under erasure. When they deal with erasure as a material and graphic expression, they need to be aware at least of its complexity and multiple dimensions. When I claim that erasure as an aesthetic strategy cannot be thought of independently of its socio political dimensions, I was thinking about the multiple source material currently being used, as well as the type of interventions they allow. But the revival of the documentary form, whether analog or digital, whether real or fabricated, is helping authors in better addressing these issues. To me, the most intriguing, complex and fascinating work has been coming out of the entanglement of these practices and dimensions. So, to end, I'll give some pointers and tell you that uh, you can find more info on my project at alvarosaisa.net slash artdel. I hope you have enjoyed all my input. Since the talk is broadcast at 1 a.m. Bergen time, feel free to write me an email with any comments or questions. I look forward to it. Thank you.